The Spartan program harnessed the peak of technological advancement in the 26th century to produce highly effective super soldiers that became legends across the UNSC. Tempting as it may be to assume their most lethal weapon is whatever they're holding, their truly devastating tool is the armor they inhabit, Mjolnir. This suit is at the bleeding edge of technology, reaping the benefits of many fusion reactors, alien shield technology, and neural-driven gel layers that could lead you to believe it operates on telepathy. Without Mjolnir, Master Chief would have had a pretty bad time on Installation 04, among other battles. And so, my name is Same Token, and today we'll be exploring the history of Mjolnir, as well as the technology that makes it so crucial a tool. You're watching Mjolnir Explained. Throughout history, armor has been directly related to the advancement of weaponry. Entering the Iron Age, swords were becoming commonplace. Highly maneuverable and extremely lethal, a sword could quickly and easily slash or impale anyone unfortunate enough to encounter its swing or thrust. So, in the interest of not dying immediately, plate armor was developed to be worn over mail. Together, they made the wearer impervious to sword slashes, and even when low-powered firearms entered the picture, they could stop the low-velocity bullets. By the 16th century, full suits of armor essentially made you into a tank, but then suddenly, firearms became cheaper and more effective, and as warfare started changing, so did armor. Lightweight materials like Kevlar mixed with ceramic plate inserts allow mobility during combat, while still resisting many forms of high-velocity projectile. Yet the feeling at the time was that perhaps this wasn't enough. We went from directly resisting offensive weaponry to having to employ tactics to avoid being hit in the first place. Thus, what if armor could offer more than plating and protection and instead play an active role in combat? Computerized technology was increasingly woven into the battlefield to alleviate the limitations of the human body. Satellite guidance, unmanned drones, and surface-to-air missiles to seek and destroy those drones had all become important components of a modern military. Yet there remained many situations where a real human soldier was required. That means a lot of walking from destination to destination lugging around all this heavy, advanced technology, then, at a moment's notice, being expected to engage in combat. As a result, human efficiency with all this load may be reduced, not to mention there's a ceiling limit on the weight each soldier can carry. That's where exoskeletons come in. Devices that augment human performance, enabling increased endurance and strength. However, progress in this area was slow. Generally, exoskeletons were bulky, uncomfortable, and worse yet, useless in combat. They were built specifically for aiding soldiers, and commonly warehouse workers, in lifting heavy equipment. The minute bullets start flying, the last place you'd want to be is in one of these mechanical frames. And that's for the exoskeletons with battery packs. Most cutting-edge frames required an umbilical cord due to their high power requirements. Perfect for carrying ordnance on location, but a far cry from the armored supersuits militaries were pining after. An appetite that would only continue to grow through to the 25th century. As humanity spread across the stars, colonizing new worlds, the central governments found it increasingly difficult to maintain control over their assets in the inner and outer colonies. Insurgency had become rife, eventually necessitating the use of military force. Project Orion was created in secrecy to produce super soldiers that could quickly and covertly counter the growing rebel forces. Each Orion was an incredibly valuable asset that could only be effective when alive. Thus, this became the perfect opportunity to develop true combat exoskeletons that would offer protection 
while also boosting their efficiency even further. The Mark I Battlesuit was the Office of Naval Intelligence's first true attempt at a combat exoskeleton, and they were surprisingly powerful. With an average person inside, these suits could reach up to 20 miles per hour and lift two tons, while also being impervious to standard light weapons. Thanks to its internal haptic interface that encases the operator, controlling the exoskeleton feels like an extension of your own body, making it comfortable and intuitive to control. The benefits of powered exoskeletons and armor had finally been realized, essentially creating 25th century knights. This was the supersuit militaries craved all those years ago, but there remained a significant drawback. Much like the exoskeletons of old, Mark I battlesuits had to be tethered due to their intensive power requirements, gravely limiting their scope in combat. Ultimately, while it was considered interesting on an academic level, the project was scrapped, with the remaining prototypes being relegated to the bunkers beneath the mountains of Reach. A Mark II battlesuit was briefly prototyped with various improvements, including a sealing system so it could be used in a vacuum, but it was still tethered. Perhaps useful for repairing space stations, but not helpful in dynamic combat situations where the destruction of the relatively weak tether would turn it quickly into a heavy hunk of metal, pinning down whoever's inside. Not particularly ideal. And so that's what the final prototype hoped to address. It's clear that power was the largest barrier to true armored supersuits. As energy requirements grow, so must the size of the generators and batteries, which then makes the suit heavier and therefore require even more energy. And the cycle continues. At this stage, there were no portable generators powerful enough to handle these suits. Compact fusion plants had been under slow development and were still a long way from completion. However, a unique solution was proposed and tested. Portable generators were obviously out, as were the vulnerable tethers. Instead, power could be wirelessly broadcasted through the air. A brilliant solution, if it weren't for the fact that broadcast power generators were essentially immobile. So realistically, the UNSC were back to square one. And the Orion super soldiers were quietly cancelled for unrelated reasons, and the prototype battlesuits were shelved. Of course, thanks to one pioneering Office of Naval Intelligence scientist, both concepts would be revived, and this time finally delivered upon. The battlesuit prototypes had realized many of the core concepts for effective armored exoskeletons. Although they were eventually scrapped, they would act as the basis for the Cyclops, a non-combat logistics platform that played to their strengths of being strong, fast, and easily controlled by an average person. Yet they were still bulky, loud, and impractical for most combat environments and there still remained a craving for a true, man-sized, form-fitting supersuit. Insurgency was still on the rise throughout the colonies, inspiring a Dr. Catherine Halsey to revive both of the UNSC's covert projects, to produce super soldiers in battlesuits. Under her watch, the second generation of Orion, named the Spartan II project, was improved upon in every way. However, when she arrived at the prototype powered exoskeletons the Office of Naval Intelligence had been working on, she felt as though there was too little progress, too little to salvage to achieve her vision. A vision that saw the armor as being extraordinarily, almost impossibly strong. Although she didn't know it, there were external forces in her motivation to produce this armor. She had received an imprint by the Forerunners, the ancient alien species, that humanity had only just begun to uncover. This 
drive led to a fast start for her revolutionary powered assault armor she was calling Mjolnir. Designed to complement her Spartan super soldiers in every way, Mjolnir enhanced their physiological augmentations with a slew of bleeding edge technologies the original battlesuits couldn't muster. Each Mjolnir suit was tailored to the individual Spartan, built to perform at its absolute peak continuously for months without maintenance. And most importantly, after many months of intense research, Halsey solved that vexing energy requirements situation it was originally thought that no one would willingly strap a nuclear reactor to their back. Fortunately, Halsey knew just the people for the job, her fearless Spartans. Continuing on from the battlesuit prototypes, the first armor line to materialize from Mjolnir was the Mark IV. Acting as the basis for a new era of military technology, it pioneered the development of compact fusion reactors that solved the massive energy requirement while being truly portable. No longer was a large generator required. As such, this was the single most vital piece of technology for Mjolnir to become viable. Originally, Dr. Halsey had wanted Mjolnir to be completely modular without the need for generational upgrades, allowing for constant iteration. That didn't sit well with the military who wanted an eye-wateringly expensive project like this to fit neatly into fiscal year budgets. And so she compromised. On paper, each generation would work around their quarters. But outside of that, she would deliver new technologies as soon as they were ready. Powered motors, like the ones used in all previous exoskeletons, enable greatly increased strength. But this comes at a cost. Fine and complex motions, like the ones produced by the human body, require an exponential number of motors to accurately recreate. A large quantity of small motors might be fine for carrying light loads, but Mjolnir needed to do more. In finding a new solution, Dr. Halsey looked to the past. The piezoelectric effect discovered 700 years prior is a phenomenon where certain materials produce an electric charge when subjected to stress or deformation. Interestingly, the reverse is also true. By applying an electric charge to a piezoelectric material, Halsey found you could cause them to deform in a specific direction. Thus, polymerized lithium niobacene a piezoelectric, man-made material originally created to discharge the static electricity from starship hulls caused by entering slipstream space was selected to be woven into a layer of Mjolnir shaped around its user. By applying a charge to this material, its shape could be freely altered quickly and smoothly. And best of all, it is extremely strong. It was called the Reactive Metal Liquid Crystal Layer, flawlessly enhancing the speed and power of its wearer. And that is just a single layer of Mjolnir, which is more an airtight sandwich than a single piece of armor plating. Touching the skin of the wearer is an absorbent cloth suit surrounded by a gel-filled layer which regulates temperature whilst absorbing moisture. And perhaps most imposing to the observer is the outer shell, made of an exceptionally durable multi-layer alloy. Perhaps this would have been overkill against its original intended targets, the insurrectionists that spurred Mjolnir's development in the first place. But soon after its creation, humanity encountered its greatest threat, the Covenant and Mjolnir quickly represented far more than simple enforcement. That's why the outer alloy was augmented with a refractive coating that could disperse energy attacks from the Covenant weapons. Mjolnir is built around the wearer, automatically molding itself to their form, matching their body temperature. 
Coupling all those layers with its effortless feeling of weightlessness, it essentially becomes a second skin. Like a sensory deprivation tank, inside, if you closed your eyes, you wouldn't even know you're encased. The onboard computer systems can interface with the Spartan's enhanced neural implants, effectively intercepting their thoughts. For instance, simply by thinking, the Spartans can operate their heads-up display to open secure comm links or even mark targets. And then there's the signals from the brain controlling motor functions, where Mjolnir knows if you want to move your leg or arm before the signal from your brain even reaches your own limbs. All this reduces the threat of task saturation and creates a unique bond between man and machine. As controlling the suit is literally like controlling your own body, focus can be entirely on the combat environment. Thus, Mjolnir's protection is uncompromising without affecting efficiency. In fact, it greatly enhances its wearer's performance, fractally scaling and amplifying input force, resulting in increased reaction speed and strength by more than five times when compared to normal humans. Of course, the comparison with average people is purely academic, for wearing Mjolnir is lethal for those without Spartan augmentations. Because it amplifies movements, a simple muscle twitch in a human subject's arm would send it flying. Any attempts to compensate would then be further amplified until their limb is literally torn apart, and that would just be their arm, assuming they begin to panic and move other limbs while spasming in pain Unaugmented humans are ricocheted to death within the suit. Scientists working on Mjolnir found this out the hard way. Thus, at least at this stage, this armor was to be used exclusively by Spartans, who have the strength to withstand these extreme forces. To them, Mjolnir was flawless. During their training sessions, they were candid about their love for the armor, a love Dr. Halsey shared having successfully realized her vision. Ultimately, the Mark IV Mjolnir was overkill against its intended targets, but by the time it was put into service in 2525, the Covenant were already decimating Earth's colonies with their superior technology. Thus, this armor would become instrumental in preventing the total annihilation of humanity through providing decades of service with the Spartans. Dr. Halsey had many ambitions for the future of Mjolnir. By Mark VII, she was hoping to create and shape energy shields so they could, for instance, be used as airfoils. But alas, the Mark V would be her final design, entering service in 2551, 26 years after the Mark IV. Yet, this variant would go on to protect the Master Chief against the Covenant, and worse, while he was stranded on a halo ring. His survival is thanks in part to two crucial upgrades, energy shields and the ability for the suit to house an entire smart AI. In 2536, over a decade after the Human Covenant War had begun, a human scientist had finally reversed engineered the Covenant's advanced shield technology, which far outstripped the effectiveness of humanity's own attempts. The first thought was to integrate it with starships, but the designs at the time simply couldn't produce enough power to shield an area that large. However, Dr. Halsey believed that the Mark V Mjolnir that was in development, with its new generation of fusion reactor with plenty of overhead, would make the perfect testbed for this shield technology. Instead of an entire ship, all they had to do is shield a single suit of armor. And it worked. After so many years of failures in reverse engineering Covenant technology, and thus so many years facing an enemy that vastly exceeded humanity's capabilities, this represented a beacon of hope. 
Technically, the first variant of Mjolnir to feature energy shields in active service was a B variant of the Mark V produced for the Spartan III program using private contractors. Eventually though, the technology would make its way to the internally developed base Mark V design. The Mark V energy shields provide full coverage and even outperform the Covenant technology from which they were derived. Essentially acting as a physical barrier, they hover above the armor by just a millimeter. So close, the wearer retains the ability to manipulate objects with the shields activated. The only drawback is they are slick to the touch. Moving with them on has been described as feeling oiled, which would be of no use in combat. Thus the emitters around the gloves and boots can be adjusted to increase traction, at the expense of making those areas more vulnerable. And then when in zero-g environments, they can be maximized to increase protection. Soon this shield technology would make its way onto UNSC warships, as was the original intention. And just as those shields were scaled up, smart AI was scaled down adapting a highly advanced computer system traditionally housed in a starship to fit inside that single suit of armor. By the 2500s, smart AI were highly advanced digital life forms capable of true intellectual development. Instead of being programmed, as is the case with so-called dumb AI, Smart AI are created by scanning a human brain, making them uniquely positioned and trusted to assist in the running of human colonies and starships. Dr. Halsey had worked extensively on the construction of Smart AI, and so naturally she sought to link them with her Spartan and Mjolnir projects. Sandwiched between the Mark V circuits and bio layers is a weave of memory processor superconductor. Or in other words, the same material as an AI's core. Because the suit can already connect with the brain via neural implants, any smart AI stored on board can interface with the wearer in a way never seen before. In that sense, data can be directly implanted on the fly. Automatic translations as well as tactical and strategic field information could be communicated as if the wearer was thinking it themselves. Essentially, this AI would be inside the mind of whoever dons Mjolnir. As such, pairing the right AI with the right Spartan was essential. They would be connected at an almost incomprehensibly deep level. And because of this, the successful pairing of Spartan John 117 with smart AI Cortana near the end of the Human Covenant War was imperative to save humanity. Following the Mark V, new iterations came quickly. Compared to the Mark IV's almost three decade lifespan, the Mark VI arrived just under a year after the V and incorporated only a handful of minor upgrades. Other than a modified base design, it improved on the energy shields featured in the Mark V and V-B, refined the exoskeleton, and standardized the plug-in modules. A biofoam injector was also integrated, which could temporarily seal wounds, negating the need for the armor to be removed to apply life-preserving measures. This generation of Mjolnir saw John 117 through the final intense months of the Human Covenant War, culminating in the intense firefights against not only the Covenant, but also the parasitic flood on the Ark. And post-war, Cortana was able to modify and upgrade this armor while Master Chief was in cryosleep, using a process known as minifacturing, which uses nanotechnology to manipulate matter. Ultimately, however, he soon swapped this out for something entirely new. Following the war, and with Dr. Halsey essentially out of the picture by this point, an entirely new revision of Mjolnir was created. As the entire base architecture was altered, 
This was known as Mjolnir Gen 2. Mass production was now a key factor in the design, as this was to service the new Spartan 4 program. Unlike the Spartan 2s and 3s, which saw children either abducted or brainwashed, or both really, this program was open to active duty soldiers. After generations of being shrouded in secrecy and mounds of funding that seemingly evaporated from the wider UNSC budget, the new, more open Spartan Operations branch likely had their spending under a microscope. Thus, Gen 2 was designed for ease of manufacturing. The exoskeleton was simplified, drastically reducing costs, while retaining backwards compatibility with older armor systems. Custom components were replaced by standardized modular systems, trading efficiency for improved manufacturing lead times and spare parts management. Plus, even more private contractors were brought in, with those who already worked on the Gen 1, Mark 5, and Mark 6 projects having a considerable head start in streamlining this new production process. However, as most of Gen 2's improvements were in manufacturing, its users quickly felt dissatisfied with the lack of new features over Gen 1, spurring the early development of its successor, Mjolnir Gen 3. Mjolnir's latest variant, the Gen 3, began manufacturing four months after the rise of Cortana's created, which had once again plunged humanity into a desperate fight for survival. Weighing twice as much as Gen 2, this new revision focuses on performance and protection above all else. It features advanced survival protections that can keep occupants alive in the vacuum of space for months. A new fusion reactor that can restore power to vehicles. And holographic emitters that can be used to project the image of onboard AI avatars. New attachments are available too, including the Grapple Shot, a grappling hook of incredible strength that makes use of Gen 3's increased mass to pull objects towards the wearer and even pull the wearer towards suitable surfaces. These improvements have once again been crucial to the Master Chief's success, this time in his campaign against the Banished on Installation 07. Ultimately, Mjolnir is a technical marvel that has enabled Spartans, like the Master Chief, to excel in extreme combat situations, effectively saving humanity many times over. Just as plate armor over mail countered swords and Kevlar countered bullets, armor in the 26th century can counter the weapon technology of highly advanced aliens. If it were not for the Human Covenant War, this armor would have stricken fear into anyone who dared rebel against Earth's government. But as it happens, Mjolnir is a beacon of hope, blending cutting-edge technology, like portable fusion reactors and energy shields, with classic notions of warfare in that there is a person inside rather than some drone, culminates in a symbiosis between man and machine. Mjolnir is most effective with Spartans, and Spartans are most effective with Mjolnir. And so, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a like, and subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss the next episode. Stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.